um, I did this story on my last YouTube channel, um, and I just thought I'd redo it because the last time I did it there was a few slip ups and, um, I look completely different, so I'm just gonna try and avoid having people say that I stole whatever from a different channel or, or I, yeah, I don't know. I don't actually, saying something like that implies that there's enough interest in me that somebody would actually say something like that. And I don't think there is. Um, this is a story of mine called I'm Mad, What About You? Um, and it's a story about a girl who basically gets put in a mental hospital. I don't even know how to describe it. Um, it started off really embarrassingly different and I'm not going to say exactly why, I mean how it was different. Because <laughs> it's humiliating. Um, but this rewrite is a lot better. This rewrite's kind of old, but I reread it last night in parts so that were so hilarious that I just felt that I had to, I had to share it. So, yeah, um, this is I'm Mad, What About You? <clears throat> the big tree in our local park is entirely black now. Hmm? I can't exactly recollect how this came to be. I do know it's closely linked with the graffiti on the front wall of my house and gaps big enough to accommodate two small fists and one boot in all three of my windows. It was a blur of bright city lights and black paint, breaking glass and ornaments and shrieking. Oh, God. It sounded like me, but I wasn't aware of any sound escaping from my lungs. The first truly whirlwind night on the town I've ever had and I only remember segments of the whole thing. First, twirling and spinning and the feel of pavement under my ground, under my feet, mixed with the weight of a spray can in my sweaty palm. Paint and pavement mixed, mingled with grass and green leaves, danced around trees that towered into the sky. The whoosh of paint from can coating the tree until it was something frightening and twisted. A completely black tree in the middle of the great wide park and the night that was equally as dark as the tree. The paint-stained glass surrounding the charcoal tree cold under my face as I cowered long into the dark night. I didn't notice when cars began to arrive. The people began to form and blurry figures started to handle me, to bundle me up and to put me into a car. I had not the strength to cry out or even to whimper. This wasn't due to the influence of any foreign substance other than my mind. Because I had created all of this on the day that my mind snapped. The day that I snapped. It could have been the day that changed my life. But that happened months ago. <laughs> Did I make some sort of subconscious decision, decision to disassociate with my present life? Or was it something to do with destiny? I don't think I'd ever know. <clears throat> I woke up in bed the next day. I dressed in the jeans I'd worn a few days previous, well attempted to dress in them. The holes in the knees were again the bane of my existence as my foot mistook the hole for the end of the jeans. I feared at the end of this month my beloved pants would have to become short. The old me would have hated the thought of changing this wardrobe staple at all. The old me would have worn these pants until the seams gave out. And with good reason too. My popularity had gone down the drain at the hands of these jeans. One afternoon, one long summer day, I'd spent uh, crouched on a sunlit blemished rock like a fancy-clad turtle, skinning the life out of the knees of these precious pants. Why, I had no idea. Perhaps the lengthening days had driven me to desire central air vents, or maybe it was my fragile sense of fashion. Either way, it seemed really stupid when a camera flash went off and the telltale rustle of a bush informed me of some sort of assailant. On Monday, my flower-covered arse was all over the boards and boards. So maybe my change had nothing to do with destiny, and it was just due, due to my unwillingness to take anything from anyone anymore. Once the pants were on, I staggered downstairs. There, sitting in a chair in the room, was the pointiest-looking woman I have ever seen. That is the only way I can describe her. Pointy. Her hair immaculately combed and her clothes were grey and tailored, folded tight against her body. I had a vague recollection of, recollection of her sharp figures dancing through my line of vision as I lay against the night, completely helpless. Hi? I asked, more like the question, what are you doing in my living room? 
On these words, she rose, and I advanced closer to her. She stood shorter than me, but exuded an air of superiority, uh, an air of superiority that I think was supposed to chill me. I, she began, in some sort of heavy accent that I couldn't quite register, am Dr. Natasha Vasiliev. She glared at me. Last night, several members of my hospital staff rushed to your aid and deposited you onto your doorstep. I am here today to honour the hospital's policy of uh, checking up on patients. Patient, I repeated, sceptically. Just then, my mother entered the room and rushed over to me, taking no consideration about my throbbing head. I gave a prolonged wince as she was squeezing me in a vice-like hug. I raised one finger to my lips to try and tell her to shut up in the most polite way possible. Oh, <laughs> of course, she said, dropping her arms around, uh, dropping her arms from around me. But I still know she had no clue how I was feeling. I staggered over to to the couch and flopped down. I looked over at Doctor Natasha, who sat almost regally in my favourite chair. I hated her all the more and just wanted her out of my house. My mother, however, bustled around with tea and small cakes, attempting to aid her tolerance of the place, apparently. I found myself sighing. <sighs> okay, so you've checked up on me. Why are you still here? Franny, my mother said absently while handing me a cup of tea. Don't be rude to our guests. Our guests? I asked incredulously. What the hell have I got to do with her? I spat. I control more than you think, she said in a calm voice that made me want to spear tackle her. Oh yeah, Natasha, I spat, mocking her with a very poor Russian accent. What is it that you control? I will overlook your choice of bad manners and choose to inform you now of something that you are likely to find unpleasant. More than you being in my house? Doubtful, I said, rolling my eyes. Mrs. Davis, she said coolly, please. I think it is time to tell the child. My mother looked torn. Between pleasing our new queen and whatever loyalty she had left for me, I assumed. <sighs> Franny, as you know, I was very worried about you last night, and you, you could have hurt someone or, or yourself. So when Dr. Natasha intervened and offered to help you, I agreed. Just wait a second, I said slowly. Help me. Yes, honey, Mum said tightly. You're booked in for a stay at the hospital. Everyone says that when bad news is told, time slows down. I can't say whether that's true for me, but I did feel numb. So numb that I scarce felt the teacup drop from my hands and send its liquid contents spilling into the carpet. Franny! Look what an awful mess you've made! My mother stole with me. You could have broken my good cup! Your good cup, I repeated. Your good cup, I stared at her. I am very sorry, Mum, I said in a dead tone voice, before raising my unclad foot and bringing it down with a stomp upon the pathetically empty piece of china. It splintered immediately, sending shards into the abyss, then to the carpet, and painfully as they skewered into my foot. Her response was to gasp. Mine was to pick up the remains of the teacup, set them on the table, and remark, We wouldn't want that, now would we? Before turning on my heel and trucking blood all the way to the front door. Um, that's the end of part one, and I'll probably put up a couple of more pieces later, maybe tomorrow. Um, I don't know how many pieces I'll have left. This is an eight-page story, so maybe three, maybe three. So we'll see how we go. Okay, thanks. Hope you enjoyed.